Hey, thanks for checking out the Solid Verbal. Now would be a great time to subscribe to the channel for college football content all off season long. Joining us now, longtime friend of the Verbal, you know him from uscfootball.com, from the Peristyle Podcast, the one, the only, Ryan Abraham. Sir, how you doing? I'm uh, doing okay. How are you guys doing? We're doing all right. It's, I, it, it's great to have you back. It's been a long time, man. How you been? It, it's been a while. I know we're like whenever I listen to you guys' show and uh, thinking back to when we both started podcasting, which I believe was 2008. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's many, many years uh, doing this <laughs> podcast thing. So it, it's it's kind of fun and see it grow. And, you know, now everybody has a podcast, but we were doing it back in the day when it was, before it was cool. That's before true. it was cool. You know, it, man. Well, it's great to talk to you as always. Um, look, we brought you on for a year one debrief of USC under Lincoln Riley, but I think we'd be remiss if we didn't at least recognize the incredible year it must have been for you as a USC content guy, because this was sort of the year that USC became the villain, the, the quote unquote villain, right? Because they poach Lincoln Riley, Lincoln Riley then poaches players from some of the teams across the country, and then they all make off in this big getaway car to the Big Ten. Do you feel dirty covering USC now? Where are you well, at with this? Yeah, no, I feel I feel pretty good. I mean, there was it was sort of like seven years of squeaky clean, Clay Helton, really nothing going on, fans not excited, and we just it didn't matter what we do. You got you know you guys create content all the time. If USC signed you know a five star player, everyone on our message boards or on Twitter would say, well, it doesn't matter. Clay Helton's the coach. It was <laughs> years and years of that, yeah. and then. It started in that September, you know, after losing to Stanford and they fired right. Clay Helton. And then fans started to go, oh, maybe the administration actually cares. And then, like you mentioned, there was just sort of been this whirlwind of, of positive news around the program, which we've been covering crazy drop everything news around USC for a long time. But usually it was on the negative side. There are actually some things that were that most people would consider positive, um, you know, hiring Lincoln Riley, you know, being able to. Uh, go 11, you know, win 11 games in the regular season, win a Heisman Trophy, sneaking out to the Big Ten. I mean, there's cr some crazy stuff that's been going on, but it it has generated some juice in the fan base. And like you said, maybe, you know, being more of a national villain, I I think that was the, the biggest issue through all of this is USC wasn't nationally relevant. Like, you didn't need to talk about USC. Why haven't I been on your show? Was USC didn't really matter uh, in college football. And now, for one reason or another, they do again. And so that, that's been that's been good to cover. So let me start with the obvious question. I, I would presume it's relatively easy for you. I think it's relatively easy for Dan and I, but you're the guru. People want to hear from you from A through F. If you are grading year one under Lincoln Riley, what what is the grade? I mean, it's a good question. I would say, I mean, I would probably go like an A minus or so. I mean, just I don't want to undersell how bad they were the year before. Uh, you know, they were four and eight. To turn around and win 11 games, you beat both rivals, UCLA and and Notre Dame. Um, you know, the, the schedule wasn't as hard. And, you know, they lose to Utah twice. They lose in a bowl game. But they won a Heisman Trophy. I mean, that's like a thing that you you talk about year in and year out. I mean, there's, you know, you don't win 11 games often. You don't win Heisman Trophies often. So to do that in one year, uh, I think it's a pretty big improvement. They definitely need help on the defensive side of the ball. The, the special teams were pretty bad, too. But. I would just say overall, taking over a team that was really in the doldrums. And if you hired someone that was like a really good power five coach, but maybe not the level of Lincoln Riley. And we all thought like, hey, eight, nine games, that would be a great turnaround. So you've sort of changed the bar. I don't want to like change the bar later on, but, you know, four and eight to 11 wins Heisman Trophy. I'm, I'm going to go like a minus or so. Yeah. That's good. Un yeah. Unquestionably a wildly successful year one, considering where that program was. And even if the talent wasn't horrible in that four and eight season, it, it was clear that the culture was off. The, the motivation was off. And this was not a team that could get up to play even medium sized games. What to you now after year one, is there anything clearer about Lincoln Riley's vision for the program? Obviously it's, get as many good players, win as many games, and figure it out as we go initially. But whether it comes to recruiting strategy, whether it comes to coach hiring strategy, whether it comes to scheme strategy, do you have a clearer picture now as you assess? I know you've spent more time now with Lincoln Riley than you did originally. What What is the vision for the next two to three years as they make the transition to the Big Ten? 
Yeah, Dad, we actually had a couple months ago a sit down with uh, maybe seven or eight of us that are local beat reporters. Mm -hmm. And it was like two hours of just talking with Lincoln Riley in a room. And uh, it was it was really insightful. And I feel like the message that he was portraying and, I, you know, I, I'm not, you know, coaches say whatever they want all the time. But right. the message that we were getting out of this was, hey, man, when I took over, there were so many problems. And I get it. I think. Mike Bone, the athletic director, did the same thing when he took over at USC. There were so many problems, and how, you got to start fixing the little ones first and some of that low-hanging fruit. And I've, the message he was conveying to us was, I really just needed to get things going in the right direction. And obviously, they were able to do that. And now you can kind of focus on some of the more, you know, he can, as a head coach, instead of just looking at the offense, can look on the defensive side of the ball more and kind of spread his time out a little bit more. But he, you know, he was talking about all the different little things that you need to fix, and this wasn't right, and that wasn't right, from nutrition to wherever it was. And now they've built some sort of base. And he didn't make any changes on the coaching staff, and some of that was, you know, hey, now we've all been in the system before, and last year, everyone coming in, it was new to everybody. You were either, if you were on the team before, it's a whole new program. If you weren't on the team before, now you're on a new, you know, it's, and then the staff was new, and everything was, it was new to everybody. And now there's at least a bunch of players that have been there before and coaches that have kind of gone through it and they know the expectations of what everyone is looking for. And I feel now the new players coming in can kind of learn from the players that were there last year. That That's kind of what he was, you know, you know, talking about. And it made sense, you know, that they needed to kind of build, get some sort of continuity from last year. I know a lot of fans wanted to see defensive coaching changes and things like that, but Riley was sort of like, okay, we're going to go with what we have. We're going to get some better players in here and, you know, kind of build on what they established last year. I think it's going to be, you know, the proof will be in the pudding because it's a tougher schedule and all of that to, to build on. And right. you already won 11 games and you already won a Heisman. So, I mean, the, 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 the expectation levels have risen, but I feel like that's where they're sort of going with Dan is they needed to kind of build that, just the, the foundation of this house and then kind of build on top of it from there. We'll see how successful he'll be, but, that's that's kind of what the message has been uh, this offseason. So you mentioned the defense and the struggles on the defense. Obviously, it was quite clear to anybody who watched this USC team that they largely had to outscore teams rather than shut down other teams in order to, to come away with those 11 wins. Uh, they hit the portal hard once again on both sides of the ball. No surprise. When you look back at the season, was an was it an Alex Grinch thing, as a lot of USC fans will point to, that it's a scheme thing, that they're not utilizing players correctly and, you know, they're not teaching players correctly? Is it a talent thing? Is it a, you know, an everything thing? Um, how do you diagnose what exactly went wrong for what down the stretch was a, a pretty woeful defense? It was. And it, I think the tough part, Dan, was if you look at the prior year, they were really bad on defense, too. Right. So. That's been the one kind of constant. And I feel like, you know, bringing in the guys they brought in on offense uh, to bring in like a Bolitnikoff Award winner, sure. Jordan Addison, to bring in the eventual Heisman Trophy winner, Caleb Williams. I think that made a big difference. And you had a, you know, Lincoln Riley can coach offense. So I feel like you fix things on the offense quickly. And it's probably easier to do that too. The defensive side, I think they tried to do some things, but they weren't really bringing in established starters or all American type of players on the defensive side. So I think they tried to do that a little bit more. I feel it's more of a combination of, of kind of everything. Um, you know, we got to watch one spring practice so far. They took spring break, but the one practice we watched, they did a lot of tackling drills, like right in front of us, like the, the 20 minute portion we got, they did a lot of tackling right in front of the media. So I think that's something they're trying to push out there. Like, <laughs> Hey, we tackle yeah. practice. We're trying to do this. Um, but yeah, I, I feel like it's more of a combination of, of everything. And, you know, the fact that Lincoln Riley is sticking with that staff, he has confidence in Alex Grinch that they can deliver. And they've, you know, he's had some good defenses in the past, a lot of, you know, criticism as well. So you're sort of like, if you're trusting in Lincoln Riley, you're kind of rolling with his decision. But if we're seeing the same sort of tackling issues and, you know, giving up uh, first downs on third and longs and all that, then you're going to have to, you know, take a look at something else. But the, I feel like that they feel pretty confident that they're going to make the defense significantly better uh, in 2023. That's just the, the kind of vibe I get. But like I get, you know, we're up to wait and see. But right. I feel like they feel like they've made the uh, enough moves that this can be, you know, an elite offense again, but also 
a good defense. And if you have that, then you should be able to win a lot of games. What's your biggest question for Alex Grinch? If you had him on your show, like what, what, what answers do you want from him directly on how he's going to fix what was wrong last season? Because as you said, it's probably a collection of factors, but in looking at the efficiency numbers that Dan and I look at frequently, it's kind of a car crash. They were all bad. So where do you start other with than that? Turnovers, and, other than other turnovers, other than turnovers, force, and I think yeah. starting field position on defense. Everything else is in in the deep red. What what would you want to pin him down and get from him, Ryan? Yeah, the turnovers were a big. Uh, a, you know that was that was what kind of kept the defense afloat. And to be fair, like Alex Rich has come on my show. When you talk to him, I don't know if there's anyone that's going to be more honest. Uh, I mean, USC fans hated when we would interview Clay Helton and you might lose to like Oregon state or something. And the first thing he would talk about is how hard they played and how proud he was. And, <laughs> and fans just wanted to like, they would just want to jump off a building. They're like, what are you talking about? Alex Grinch will come out and say, we were God awful. Like that was the off field. We needed to tackle better. So he's, I think he's really sort of upfront about when they have, you know, the deficiencies and how bad they've been. Sometimes when they're really bad, we don't get to talk to Alex Grinch. So he doesn't, we don't get to hear that, but, um, I think he's been pretty honest about most of his assessments of of what's going on. And, you know, the, the tackling has certainly been an issue. And sometimes when you hear from Lincoln Riley and he'll say, like, players were in the right position and they didn't make the tackle. I, to me, that's more of a saying, like, hey, I think we had a good scheme. We just didn't have the right guys uh, making plays. I look at it. I mean, I, we when we see college football, you know, there's a, so much offense going on. The the wide receivers are great. You always have three, four great wide receivers. I think when you you become an elite team, it's that defensive pass rush is really good. You got these elite, you know, guys that are just coming off the edge and and making sacks. And they had Tuli Tui and Pelotu who lead the nation in sacks, but outside of that, they didn't really have anybody. And I feel like they got to get better there. And for years, they've just underperformed. I think at the linebacker spot, they've had good players in the secondary. But just not getting that kind of production that you want out of uh, out of the linebackers, and they brought some. They got a couple of young guys in this year. Uh, you know, they bring in Mason Cobb from Oklahoma State, who was a kind of tackling machine. So they're trying to assess that. But to me, it's a lot of the front seven. You got to get a better, you know, edge pass rush and just get better play out of the linebackers. Where I feel like they've had some talent, they just don't seem to be able to to bring it there. One of the things that's interesting you bring that up, one of the things I looked at before we started recording is where USC under Lincoln Riley is recruiting on defense and SC famously, and it's not just a Pete Carroll thing. You look at Lane, Sark, even Clay Helton, went across the country looking for big defensive talent up front. And we, we got some great individual performances, but it's it's been a USC unit, the defensive line, the, the front seven, that hasn't you know, has sort of fallen off in these last 15, 20 years. And under Lincoln Riley, they haven't necessarily had the recruiting success on defense. And certainly you mentioned hitting the portal, and that's that's a vision for where USC can go on defense. But how do you, I mean, you use the word assess, but how do you, you how do you assess what this staff has done on the trail? I looked it up. It was, I think, one blue chip defensive lineman in these past two classes, whereas, you know, you look at the new Big Ten teams they're going to be facing. You're talking, you know, five, six, seven, eight guys. Oregon in the last couple of years is, you know, six, seven guys, blue chip defensive linemen. Uh, do you see this? Uh, you know, ticking in an upwards direction these next couple of years? Should that be a, a piece of concern? Or is it just going to be, you know, all systems go to the portal on defense? I, You know, I think Lincoln Riley's vision was to not have to utilize the portal as much, even in year two, you know? Right. And I, I feel like they were recruiting last year for the class of 2023 on the potential. And I think now they're looking for 2024 is, it's usually like the year before, like, hey, you know, this team did win 11 games and they were in the Pac-12 championship and all that. Um, you know, it was a big turnaround. And I feel like they're, they're getting a little bit more momentum in 2024, but they didn't have as successful of a, you know, a recruiting class for 2023 as you would have liked, especially on the defensive side of the ball. They brought in some really studs on the offensive side, but, mm -hmm. you know, they get Tackett Curtis, the linebacker out of Louisiana that they, they're in love with and they really love him. But, you know, the big defensive linemen like an Anthony Lucas, who was a five-star recruit, but you know, transfers in from Texas A&M. They want to get those guys kind of out of high school and sort of develop them. So I, I feel like their focus is now on 2024, trying to get those guys into the program, the elite defensive players from high school, because they haven't, like you mentioned, they just haven't been able 
to land some of those guys, uh, you know, in the last couple of years. And, you know, if they have more success on defense this year, like Lincoln Riley's talked about and, you know, what they're really focused on, I think they will be able to have more success. I guess the fallback, though, is if you can't, then there's guys that are willing to come to L.A. for whatever reason mm-hmm. and try you know, try their hand at playing for USC. But I think the focus, they would love to get that success on the, from high school, but they didn't. They, they did pretty well in 2023 on offense, just not on the defensive side. So they'll try in 2024, and if not, like I said, like you guys mentioned, it'll be uh, probably more you know hitting the portal as hard as you can. Ryan, but, USC had the top-rated offense per the SP Plus last season, as you mentioned earlier. Look, we know Lincoln Riley can coach offense. If there's anything Lincoln Riley can do, it's coach offense. So maybe not a great surprise. Where's the but I'm hell just... out of a visor, Ty? That too. Yeah, where's the hell out of a visor? Um, and clearly is enjoying the the warm weather of Southern California. So all these things I think we know to be true. But I'm curious from your standpoint, Ryan, how much of what we saw last season from that offense was clever play design and clever schematics versus an exceptional talent, a Heisman caliber talent and Caleb Williams running around behind the line, creating hero plays, playing hero ball. Yeah, I think if you just looked at the 2022 USC offense in a, you know, in a vacuum, you could say this was Caleb Williams. Like he just went off and uh, it depends, you know, he lost top receivers from time to time and would other guys would fill in. You've seen multiple guys have, you know, huge receiving games where a guy like Kyle Ford is not even with the program anymore, has a monster game and then he doesn't do anything for a while. Or uh, Brendan Rice, who's the transfer from Colorado has like a, you know, huge game here and doesn't show up there. He sort of was able to do it with no matter who was out there at the wide receiver spot or if they had running backs banged up. But looking at the whole track record, I think Lincoln Riley's proven that he's probably a big part of why all of this is working, you know, and the, sure. the fact that he's had as many Heisman winners and Heisman finalists as he's had, uh, it, I think, and with guys that have different skill sets, uh, I think it shows a lot. And for him to come in and all the things that he did have to fix when he was at USC, that wasn't just things that were on the field, off the field, whatever it was, the perception. And there was a lot of problems that he had on his sheet. He said he had like six pages of notes or whatever. I forget what it was. It was some crazy <laughs> amount of notes where he normally has like one or two pages of things to focus yeah. on. It was like a lot. Um, but I think he did a good job of, you know, putting the guys in a, in a good place and, and allowing a guy like Caleb Williams that has so much talent to, you know, look for the first couple of reads. And if things do break down or if the offensive line isn't, you know, playing as well as they, they should be, he's able to go off off script and, and make some sort of play downfield. I think the last time you saw something like that, when Sam Darnold was at USC, I really felt like that was an offense that just the plays never really worked. And Sam Darnold just sort of took off and made things happen. I feel like the plays had a good chance of working. And if they didn't, Caleb Williams could go off and make things happen. So it's a little bit different. I I think with Darnold, it was just more about he was just special and he made everything work. I feel like you had, it's sort of like, you know, doubling down when you have 11 and the dealer has a six. Like the play might work, (laughs) but also, you know, hopefully the dealer busts and Caleb just goes off and makes a play. What needs to get better on offense? You know, I think this year it's going to be on the offensive line. They One of the things that um, Lincoln Riley didn't realize was how you know good of a veteran group he had last year. So losing a guy like Andrew Voorhees and Brett Nealon, uh, they bring back Justin Dietrich, which helps, but they had some really good veteran leadership uh, on that, that offensive line. And they didn't have a lot of depth. They didn't have great high school recruiting from the, the linemen, like you had mentioned, you know, for the last few years. Now, this year they bring in like five, uh, you know, freshmen and they brought in three more transfers. So they're going to have some guys that they're going to move around for some more veteran leadership, but they're going to have to make that work because it's a different looking line, a lot different than it was last year. And even though when, when guys got banged up last year, late in the season, the offensive line struggled. And I think you needed to see Caleb Williams kind of do more with his legs. When they were when they were all together, it was actually a, a, a pretty well performing offensive line. So to get back to that stage, or so you're, at least you're not going to uh, take a step back on the offensive line. I think that's going to be the biggest aspect of it: making these guys work. They bring in some talent, a couple guys from Florida, uh, starter from Washington State. You know where are those those guys going to play? But you got to make them all work together. Like the cliche is, you know, it's like five fingers on a hand. So getting those guys to kind of all play together and protect Caleb Williams. I mean. He's, He's a proven guy. He won the Heisman yep. Trophy. So right. just, 
just don't let them get sacked all the time and you're probably going to be okay. Sure. Who do you anticipate being the names on offense? Obviously losing a couple big ones, Travis Dye and Jordan Addison uh, to the next level and running out of eligibility. Uh, who do you expect to be the the players that take on that workload uh, as as the offense takes the next step? You know, I like uh, what Austin Jones was able to do. He's going to be a senior this year, the transfer from uh, Stanford. But there's a lot of people high on Marshawn Lloyd, the transfer in from South Carolina. And, you know, Raylick Brown showed a lot of flash last year as a five-star freshman running back. So I, I'm not sure how what we're going to do on the running back spot, but I think you're going to see kind of a, a combination of those guys. And, I, you know, a guy like Taj Washington who transferred in a couple of years ago from, from Memphis has, you know, he he would have flashes of some really great games. And we saw Brendan Rice have a monster uh, bowl game. Um, and, you know, Dorian Singer, the you know, he was the number two receiver at uh, Arizona you know, in the Pac-12 last year, transferring in from Arizona. And I, they love Zachariah Branch, the five-star freshman coming in. So, I, again, I feel like there's going to be, you know, some good spots at the wide receiver spot, at, at running back. Um, they didn't really do a lot at, at tight end. Um, so we're going to see kind of what they can do, you know, on there, but they, Lake McCree should be back healthy and he's someone that they, people feel have a lot of upside, but I think it's just going to be more of kind of a spreading it around. I don't know if they're going to establish like a a clear number one guy, like when you had Addison, when he was healthy last year, I think he was that guy. Uh, but if they can keep spreading around and keep defenses kind of guessing, I, you know, that's probably the way they're going to go. I think the one change is going to be, they're probably going to try to get you know, the tight ends involved more. They just, you know, they would get an occasional touchdown here or there, but they just weren't a consistent part of the offense last year. I'm wondering where is Lincoln Riley's head? Where is the USC program's head uh, in terms of the Big Ten? And obviously you don't just build for what you want to be, but you build for who you're playing against as well. And it looks like the top of the Big Ten is going to be a very different style than what the the Pac-12 has offered USC these past few years, whether it's, you know, I guess new look Wisconsin, but Ohio State, Michigan, Penn State, right? This is these are a lot of teams that put a lot of players into the NFL along the trenches. Is there any eye towards future opponents of USC in terms of where recruiting is focused, where the offense or defensive scheme is focused? Um, is, is there that eye yet? You know, it's interesting. They, you know, most of the focus is on now, obviously, of but course. we've heard we've heard that every once in a while. Like you'd see someone like. You know, in the Big Ten, they just maybe would drop that as like sort of like a, a hint of what's to come. And I think it's sort of where you've you know alluded to is that they have to get better uh, in the trenches. And it's just going to be a different style of football most of the way uh, across the Big Ten. And no one's come out and just said, you know, hey, we really need to do this for, you know, because of Big Ten purpose. I think you want to do that anyway, just to be a if you want to be a nationally competitive program, not just nationally relevant like they've become. Um, you do, you need to get better in the trenches, but I feel like that's where a lot of the focus is that they've been able to get skill guys. And, you know, you can, you, it, you know, Clay Helton brought in great skill guys, but to get elite, you know, linemen on both sides of the ball, I think the team has to be, you know, performing at another level. And I, I feel like that's where the focus is going to be going forward. And uh, it's been little hints though, Dan, about people kind of mentioning that, but I, sure. I, I don't have any doubt from the people you talk to behind the scenes that they know that that's something that, if you want to be competitive in a conference like that, and then you know going on and trying to be competitive in the college football playoffs, which USC has never made before, you got to be better on the lines. There's just no question about it. Ryan, how excited are you to visit Chicago in the winter? <laughs> <laughs> Ryan's from Big Ten country. He's from PA. Yeah, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts. When I went, yeah, to high sorry, school. yeah, yeah. Uh, I know I came out here to get away from all that, but uh, yeah, <laughs> it's funny. USC fans get a little dose of that when they go to you know south bend uh well they mostly go to chicago but that's in october i mm -hmm. mean if, if they're gonna be a minneapolis trip in november like that could be uh, <laughs> it's dicey yeah I, I think the question's gonna be like we don't know what this schedule is going to be like um what the big 10 is going to want to do but if you want some sort of mutually beneficial you know like notre dame and usc they make it so notre dame comes to los angeles in november and usc goes to south bend in october it's if you're, you know, from Minnesota, you'd probably rather be in LA in November if you could. And so maybe USC has more November home games than normal and maybe more road games in September, October. I'm I'm curious to see what they do with all that. But yeah, I'm, I'm you know, 
if you're in Wisconsin, you want to come to, to Southern California, it probably makes sense if you'd rather do it in November than September when it's warm where you are too. So I'm curious to see how it is, but there's going to be a lot of trips. I got to, you know, you, you got to increase the travel budget now mm-hmm. because it's going to be a little bit different, you know, doing what, that. What's the reaction been among the USC base? Because of the USC people, USC fans, super fans that I know here in PA, they're thrilled. They love it. But my hunch is that people who are in California maybe feel differently, maybe because of weather considerations or I don't know, more travel where like nobody could tell the temperature of the fan base better than you. Where are people at with this? It's funny in the beginning, it was pretty 50 50. And uh, I thought there would be overwhelming, like, you know, enthusiasm about this. And then it's sort of shifted. And I feel like there's a lot of USC fans that feel like, the Pac-12 never had their back when the, the Reggie Bush sanctions and all that stuff was going on. And they felt like they were, you know, carrying the torch for the conference for years and weren't, you know, didn't really get anything out of it. And now they're sort of like, hey, look, now, you know, now we're taking off to, to do this. I, I think because it's such a football focus, that's why a lot of the fans are, are on board. I think more so than UCLA fans that I talked to, that USC fans, for the most part, are kind of happy about the way this is going. I feel like though, if you're a fan of, you know, like the the volleyball teams and stuff, like, man, it's gonna, I think it's gonna be tough, you yeah. know. And uh, you know, but the, I think the focus for the football fans has been mostly positive after kind of an initial of like there's 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 old school fans that don't want to lose the rivalries with like uh Cal and Stanford, you know, and even you know, play, you know, the stuff with like Utah or Oregon or Washington, there's just a lot of history there that the fans don't really want to Uh, get rid of but they're excited about playing some of the brands i think in the big 10 as well and you know the fact that ucla will be there i think it's it's not like a texas 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 a&m thing where you're kind of getting split up at least you have your your dance partner for it but you know and and the question would be you know it'd be better if there was sort of a west coast pod like if an oregon and washington were involved but there's also the usc fans that that really hate Oregon for all the success that they've had recently <laughs> and they'd rather leave them behind. So there's kind of, like, you know, it's, it's sort of a mixed bag, but for the most, to answer your question, for the most part, I think most of the fans are really happy about this after initially maybe being more of a, a coin flip kind of thing. Right. Where, where are you at? Does it make you sad? Yeah. Let's hear the Ryan Abraham take. Yeah. Where are you at? Well, I, I mean, I do the podcast of champions too. Like we, David Woods and I, so he's a UCLA guy. We've, that's probably six or seven years. We've done a Pac-12 podcast and I've loved it. Like, it's helped me cover USC because all the play, all the teams that USC plays, I now have more deep, intimate knowledge of, and I got to talk to reporters from those markets. And I don't want to see that split up, but obviously something's going to have to change with with all of that. So as a college football fan, and just as a you know, just you know, doing my job, I think it's I'm kind of sad about it. You know, I don't want to see the West Coast sort of break up uh, like it is, but I think you know, as a business person, like it's, you know, I'm going to lose something on the PAC 12 side, but my main business is USC. And I, I feel like just from what's happened in the last year and a half, it's probably going to be a good thing for business, you know, playing yeah. Michigan and Ohio state and Wisconsin and Penn state all the time. I feel like it's going to be, you know, a positive there. So college football changes a lot. Uh, I, you know, I love the tradition of it. So it kind of makes me, it definitely makes me sad to see something like that change, but going forward, I mean, I, I feel like it's going to be, you know, benefit for uscfootball.com and everything, but it's it's not something I would have, have picked, I guess you could say. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Which Big Ten destination should expect the biggest influx of traveling Trojan fans? Where is the enthusiasm? Where is the road enthusiasm? Is it the big house? Is it the shoe? Is it Penn State? Is it Wisconsin? Where, where Who should expect uh, the interlopers from L.A.? Oh, that's a good one. I would say, I mean... I think Columbus, as far as like how, you know, USC fans remember like when Matt Barkley and Mm -hmm. Joe McKnight went there in what, 2009 or whatever. And it's not as hard to get to as some of the other spots. Like, no offense, uh, you know, Penn State, not exactly. Sure. Oh, my God. Penn State is the worst in America to get to as far as I'm concerned. So affronted, Ryan. How dare you? (laughs) And he also agrees, by the way. Uh, But but I've been, but I think me personally I'd, i've never been to the big house i would love okay. to do that i want to go check that out um but i the there's just this you know this usc ohio state thing i i don't know how they're going to pair everything up i feel like usc and ohio state are going to get paired up somehow like that's going to have to be a thing and the fact that us uh, ohio state canceled their washington game for 2024 my guess is they're coming to the coliseum uh in 2024 you know and 
uh, that'll be a crazy year. USC starts with LSU and in, in Las Vegas, potentially has like, you know, and you know, Notre Dame, and then you might have Ohio State in the Coliseum. But I feel like the Columbus one will be a big one. Um, you know, like Michigan, Ohio State, you know, Penn State's big. As far as just like environment, like going to Madison, I think is going to be, you know, amazing. But I, I think it's it, it'll be hard not to say Ohio State at this point. I want to finish this out just staying in your backyard in L.A. And this is since you mentioned that you spent, you know, a good chunk of time with Lincoln Riley. I don't know how to phrase this correctly, but is Lincoln Riley sort of uh, getting more comfortable in his own skin as the USC coach, as, you know, a Southern California resident? You know, he doesn't have the history out West. Uh, you know, the entirety of his time as a coach has been, you know, Midwest, East Coast. Does Does he seem to be uh adapting i would say to a, a pretty different way of living out west yeah i think um as far as his adaptation goes i feel like he sort of embraced it early i mean he's got young kids and a wife and they're like oh we have the ocean and disneyland and uh, they're pretty <laughs> yep. i think they're like buying right it's like you're on vacation you know <laughs> <laughs> and a bunch of the coaches, I, you know, I talked to Benny Wiley, the strength and conditioning coach sometime, you know, he posts on his Instagram all the time about like live where people go on vacation. It's like, okay, that makes sense, you know? And, um, but for, for Lincoln, I think he's one, this is now, you know, his second time being a head coach. And I think the first time when he was Oklahoma, obviously you get to learn from, uh, you know, one of the greats of all time in Bob Stoops. It was a you know pretty closed program, and I talked to media members that were covering. There just wasn't a lot of access. You never talked to assistant coaches, and USC was a kind of the other opposite you know opposite end of that. And I feel like he's adapted what he would normally do to you know kind of USC's ways, where there's more open. We get to talk to more assistant coaches. You can watch a little bit more practice. It's still more closed than it was before, but it's. I think he's adapted that to. Hey, we're in Los Angeles. You're not. We're not the only game in town. There's right. you know. Caleb Williams won the Heisman Trophy. He's probably not top 15 sports stars in the city, right? Like, I, I don't know. Like, would you say, you know, he's not bigger than LeBron James or nope. Mike Leonard or things <laughs> like that. So, like, it's that's different. So, I think he's adapted to sort of the differences of being in a major pro sports town, uh, you know, where Mike Trout is walking around versus, you know, where you're in Norman, Oklahoma. But I think the thing that he embraced the most was you have – he can go to a restaurant and he's just a guy yeah. and he's like, everyone's dropping, you know, like coming over and you'll get that. But I feel like he feels like he can be more of a human being in Los Angeles where it's, you're not under this microscope. I don't think he's the most comfortable just being in the spotlight all the time. I think he's handled it pretty well, but he can go about him and his family can go about living their lives and um, not feel like everyone that's going to come up to you and want to say something. I, I think Caleb Williams had a, Thing. Before he won the Heisman, he was like out to dinner at some nice restaurant and there's like Rihanna's in there. So like no yep. one's coming over to him to say hi, like they're going over to, to that. So I think that's one thing that they've kind of adapted to uh, at, you know, fairly quickly because it's you are it's just a much bigger pond. So you're not the, the hugest fish in a small pond. People still know who you are. And but it's not going to be the same as if you were, you know, you're you're not an A-list celebrity here like you would be and maybe more of a college town. On the flip side, how is USC adapted to Lincoln Riley and Lincoln Riley's what I assume to be expectations and visions of a major national football program? I think the last time you were on, we talked about it where it's USC has a tough time competing with hiring analysts, hiring recruiting personnel, hiring nutrition, you know, overhauling facilities just because the the cost of construction in LA, the price of the cost of living in LA, you know, if if uh, you know Texas A and M is going to pay a staffer sixty thousand dollars, you just can't get away with that at USC. It's not competitive, given the cost of living in LA. Has there been investment either thanks to boosters, thanks to administration, thanks to the anticipation of Big Ten money? Are there dollars pouring into the USC program to compete behind the scenes with? Georgia, Florida, Texas, Ohio State, Oregon, all of these places that are able to have these huge, huge, you know, program infrastructure uh, budgets. Yeah, there's definitely been an increase in in their budgets in the athletic department. I think uh, when Mike Bone took over a few years ago and, you know, there was a lot of criticism about why aren't you firing Clay Helton today? Um, a lot of it was they needed to build that sort of infrastructure behind the scenes to make a soft landing for any coach that you would bring in that right. 
And they were basically saying like, hey, we could fire Clay Helton today, but you're not hiring Lincoln Riley. You're going to get somebody else. And, you know, to, to their credit, like they did take a little time to kind of build up behind the scenes. And when they did make a hire, it was big and it was uh, Lincoln Riley. So I, you know, there was talk about, you know, facilities. Um, they've always, like you said, Dan, there's sort of always been behind uh, the curve there. Like even when Pete Carroll was around, I remember talking to their strength and conditioning coach, Chris Carlisle, and they literally had the worst weight room. I mean, I, you would go in there and it was crazy. Chris Carlisle was in a, a, a basically a closet hmm. with Reggie Bush doing like bench presses right outside of his door. And they're like, you know, number one in the country. And he told me at the time, he's like, you know, hey, we need better weight room. And he said the administration told them that we'll go win a Pac-12 championship. And they did. And they said, well, go win a national championship. And they did. He said, well, you already won. You don't really need that. And it was sort of like that's sort of been the attitude for years of you, we can make do. We don't need to do what everyone else is doing. But college football is changing. I think you have to keep up with the Joneses. Will they ever get to a budget like a Georgia or an Alabama? I don't know that, but I think they're definitely putting more resources uh, into it. They're, they've been behind on the NIL stuff for sure. And I'm curious to see where that okay. uh, kind of goes because, you know, they're, they're more selling what you could do when you get to USC and maybe that all changes now, but they're, they're not having programs where, you know, like we see at Texas A&M or Tennessee that are really, organized and, and you know funneling money in and for these players if you're caleb williams you're going to do well he gets a lot of great deals but you know it's la is more of a star driven town if you're the you know the the starting center are you really going to get to get the same kind of stuff so I, that's where i think maybe you got to look at for usc needs to get better and they've had a few collective startup just in the last several months but i feel with the administration they're putting money into it the NAL thing is more of a, as a, I don't know. I mean, they, they could get left far behind in that, or it could, you know, that whole landscape could change and they could catch up. But it's that's one area I would take a look at that I'm not sure that they know exactly what they're doing with right now. Right. Ryan, what are you watching for this spring? I think really mostly on the defensive side of the ball. If if any schematic changes are happening, um, you know, what the defensive personnel looks like, what, what we get to watch. Uh, that. The whole point, if you want to get to that next level, like, you know, they were this close to winning a Pac-12 championship. They could have potentially made the playoff and all that. But if they don't have a, a much improved defense, I don't think any of that matters. So I I feel like now the schedule is tougher. You got Oregon and Washington back on the schedule. So if yeah. they're, they're not going to skate through that. Like, they're going to have to have a better defense to to win the Pac-12 this year. So that's that's what I definitely want to watch for. How, they, how much better can they get? You talk to the guys. That, I mean, just Lincoln Riley had a lot of uh, confidence that this, this was going to be a much improved defensive team. So that's kind of what I want to see. If they can do that, then they have a real chance of actually making some more national noise this year. So as we get into spring football, then we get into summer, we get into USC's final season fully out west in the Pac-10, 12, whatever. Uh, we have Big Ten in 2024. And that also <laughs> means, aside from Ryan Abraham and all of the, the L.A. interlopers to the Midwest and East Coast, we are going to have fan bases that are not used to coming to Southern California end up you know, following their team in for a, a UCLA or a USC. And I guess we can be specific about USC here. Where should they be staying? What should they be doing? You know, downtown L.A. might be a little bit different than suburban Maryland or New Jersey or Minneapolis. You know, wh what would you recommend to those coming out for a USC game? How should they make make it a weekend? Dad, it's so funny because, I mean, you're familiar with the area. Mm -hmm. And when you when people come out for the Rose Bowl or you're like, oh, I'm staying in I'm staying in Pasadena. Is that's where everyone's staying? Like, no, you're nope. not. No one's staying in Pasadena or like, oh, I'm in Newport Beach. How close is that? <laughs> okay, that's, not, that's not very it's a day trip. Well, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I. I'm a beach guy. You know, I'm a South Bay guy. I think if you're somewhere like in the Manhattan Beach, Hermosa Beach area, you're going to you're going to enjoy yourself. You're going to have a good time. But, you know, if you're on the coast, like in Santa Monica or Venice, like there's some cool stuff uh, you can do. So it depends. I, I would love you reach out to me. You know, let me know. Like, yeah. what are you interested in? But like you're like you're not staying in like downtown Los Angeles, most likely like, oh, I'm right near the convention center. Like, OK, that's probably not that fun. Right. Um, I'm more, I would focus more on the beaches, Dan. I love okay. when, you know, if you're going to come to Southern California, stay near the beach. There's a lot of cool stuff. Uh, it's hard to go wrong with like a Santa Monica or Manhattan Beach, something like that. But just be aware, this is not like, I'm not going to jump on a train and get to uh, wherever I need to go. Like you could literally be staying like an hour and a half away from where you need to be. And people don't even realize that most of the time. Yeah. And I would also add, uh, eat Mexican food. 
That's, yes. <laughs> that's the move because most likely from where you're coming, the Mexican food will be nowhere near as good as if you're going to UCLA game, if you're going to USC game, make it a point to uh, to search out the best tacos or whatever in LA. That's 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 I think the the simplest move. Go stay somewhere near water if you can and seek out tacos. Yeah, th- you're the taco expert, uh, <laughs> but there's so many good yeah. ones. If you're going to be downtown, there's yeah. you know that whole district down there. Yep. Uh, there's a lot of cool. And it's funny, LA's a big burger place. Yeah. Which, you know, you're probably coming from somewhere that has great burgers, but there's just a lot of kind of cool burgers here. Obviously, you know, sushi and a lot of different kind of uh, Asian cuisine you mm-hmm. can get, but tough to beat, you know, the Mexican. You could just stumble upon a, a random hole in the wall Mexican place. It could be a, you know, out of this world. So I would, I would definitely uh, go with that recommendation too. Ryan Abraham, Peristyle Podcast, uscfootball.com is just one of the originals is an icon is a legend you know if you happen to be down in the south bay you'll probably run into him somewhere because that's just how it works (laughs) ryan thank you so much for your time (laughs) thank you guys very much it's always a pleasure great to be on again thank you